we're, we're going to get started. Um, thanks for being up early. This is clearly all the coffee drinkers. We know where all the beer drinkers are. They're still in bed. Um, we're going to walk through a bit of what we are doing together as um, Canonical and Juniper. Um, <clears throat> and it was designed to address something that we all are dealing with, the reality of hybrid cloud. So I'm John Zanos. I'm with Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu. Uh, Jennifer Lynn, uh, lead product management with the Contrail team at Juniper Networks. So maybe we'll start by talking a little bit about hybrid cloud. And I think we're all familiar with it. But at the end of the day, the reality is we recognize portability of applications across private and public clouds is the reality of the world we live in. We recognize that the private cloud of choice that's developing is OpenStack. Um, and the network component of that becomes extremely important when you think about a hybrid cloud and being able to have a node in the, in the private cloud, a node in the public cloud, and moving workloads and viewing them consistently. Yeah, and I think uh, what we found is that as, you know, uh, folks here obviously recognize the benefits of a cloud environment. Uh, customers don't want to have to choose either public or private. So that choice and flexibility, they want the security and control that's typically associated with a private environment and the flexibility and the sort of on-demand and the services that are often available in the public cloud environment. And a lot of the dynamic these days is that there are a lot of folks that, you know, unbeknownst, let's say, to the administrators of a private environment are starting to put workloads in a public environment. Um, we're going to talk through some of the, the key use cases of hybrid cloud, but I think it's that balance that makes it uh, kind of inevitable that we will have a mix. There's, no, there's not going to be one winner uh, on uh, you know, the, the environment. From a network perspective, our job is to interconnect securely those environments and make it seamless to a lot of the users or the cloud tenants that uh, we have a heterogeneous environment uh, underneath. Yeah, and our, our objective is to make the process of deploying an OpenStack cloud in this hybrid environment, and also deploying and managing the, the applications that will sit on top of it. Very simple, very automated, um, and in essence, making it very easy for a customer to look at both environments, almost from a single pane of glass. I think there's also been a, a lot of sort of quote cloud washing. So I think we wanted to make the point of you know what is what is hybrid cloud not? Um, there, there have been a lot of services that have been you know traditionally virtualized um, and uh, you know called cloud. I, I think this self-service provisioning aspect of it and the X as a service model is definitely something that obviously in an, in an OpenStack environment we definitely focus on and is the reason why OpenStack is is gaining a lot of ground. People want that uh, you know vendor agnostic environment where services are exposed as a service through clean and well-behaved APIs, um, which wasn't the case in many legacy virtualization environments. Right. And, and we recognize you know, people have these hosted environments that they want to then bring in a pr private cloud. Some people are starting with the public cloud and then moving to private clouds. Some people are starting with private clouds and extending workloads to public clouds when they have spikes. You know, so it's a very mixed environment, and you shouldn't, as Jennifer pointed out, think of hybrid cloud as a particular single use case is actually a number of use cases. So <clears throat> a little bit about the challenges. You know, we've talked about workload portability. I think that's one of the most important ones. The vision that I think we all recognize hybrid cloud, cloud in general, whatever we end up ultimately calling it brings to the table is this concept of workload portability. You can develop a one cloud, a private or public, move it to another one. You're going to have applications look at both environments to put some part, maybe the database on one side um, and the analytical package on another. It creates a lot of flexibility, only if the network's able to support it. Um, certainly security compliance, all the things that I know we talk about all the time about with OpenStack. And then there's a fundamental business challenge. You know, how does the company bring that forward? Who owns the budget? How do you manage that? And how do you get a company to think about things in this sort of hybrid world? And then it brings quite a few of operational challenges. At the very core, we think the operational challenge that's most important is how do you automate? And how do you make it to reuse? So how do you deploy something, deploy the network, have it work with OpenStack, 
and that not be an incredibly painful process. And for those of you that dealt with Neutron, there's plenty of room for improvement in that area, and that's what we've tried to do with this joint solution. So on the right there is just a little bit of a snapshot. Uh, you know, our, our guest speaker today, uh, their company, uh, Pier One, had done some surveys uh, very recently uh, polling users around their expectations around hybrid cloud. And one statistic uh, that we'll uh, focus in on is that 78% said that in the next couple of years they intend to be using hybrid cloud services. That, that statistic today is uh, less than 30% that are actually using hybrid cloud services, but the expectation is that that will triple over the next three years. So a lot of the market data today is needing to anticipate that this sort of flexibility between the public and private cloud environments is just a baseline capability and is not sort of a nice to have. From a network perspective, our job is to interconnect securely heterogeneous environments. Um, and while a lot of the, quote, cloud environments haven't been built with the expectation of working workload portability and sort of dynamic resource allocation based on policies uh, that may be cost, they may be time of day, they may be uh, application policies. Um, you know, we need to kind of bake that in up front in order to be ready for this tripling of, of hybrid cloud adoption. Right. I think at the end of the day, you know, we view the likelihood that there will be a point in the not too distant future that everybody will be running off a hybrid cloud. And they'll be doing that because they want to get into a world where they can write an application once, deploy it anywhere, and it would be that easy. So just a quick, uh, you know, in terms of Juniper Contrail, Open Contrail, what we've uh, been doing, and there have been some, you know, very good deep dives around the approach uh, that we've taken from a technology perspective, which we won't go into today. But w we fundamentally uh, believe that th the sort of federation of different domains with a unified control plane is what differentiates uh, Contrail from many of its competitors. Um, in terms of the, the heritage of IPVPNs, uh, you know, this has been uh, the way that most enterprises connect their mission critical traffic across a shared IP WAN that's often outsourced to a carrier network. Um, and that has really held the test of time with the evolution of, uh, you know, more dynamic workloads, et cetera. Contrail is really based on some standards-based work, uh, L3VPN end systems, that essentially takes that paradigm and stretches it into a virtualized data center environment so that we're not essentially recreating how we establish secure multi-tenancy and issues around access control and how we horizontally scale private networks. Um, so that's, uh, I, I think, been one of the areas where it's allowed us to present an overlay type of topology into a multi-vendor physical network infrastructure and scale very quickly without reinventing a lot of the uh, paradigms on, on how networks work. Uh, the other major thing is, uh, obviously, it's... Uh, been uh, released to the open source community, um, and there's sort of a knowledge in the existing networking industry about both uh, BGP control planes and how that works, as well as how we do security between federated domains. Um, and so once again, I think that the, um, you know, not reinventing the wheel, using protocols that are well tested and have stood the test of time, um, so that as we get into different types of uh, uh, encapsulations, things like VXLAN are, are very, uh, you know, uh, important in the enterprise environment. We can add those without essentially reinventing the overall architectural approach. This is just a snapshot. I mean, if, if you look at a lot of the web scale uh, folks like Facebook, um, you know, they've been talking more about how they're creating uh, this new data center environment where uh, traditionally they started with, you know, larger clusters. Um, increasingly, they're moving to smaller uh, pods that are sort of interconnected and making sure that they don't have oversubscription, you know, in the uh, physical infrastructure, but that they have any to any IP access across highly distributed workloads and very dynamic applications. Um, you know, that they're uh, being public about the fact that the way they're achieving that is using BGP as a, as a control plane within the data center. Um, obviously, BGP is, uh, you know, very pervasive in the wide area network, um, but, you know, the web scale guys saw that pulling that type of control plane protocol into the, into the data center environment was the only way that they were going to uh, be able to scale. And that allows them to do a lot of the automation, you know, this statistic of managing one, uh, managing 10,000 servers with one administrator they can only do that with high levels of automation. Um, and so uh, for, fo for folks that haven't seen it, there's a very good blog post around how the Facebook architecture has evolved and how they achieve um, a lot of the automation uh, that they do in their, in their environments. 
Right, so this sets up an environment where it's very extensible, right? The, the network becomes very flat and, and in essence, you know, the, the vision of SDN where you kind of abstract the network from any physical appliance and are able to make all the nodes visible as IP addresses is, is a key. And then ultimately, it allow, it's important that you're able to encapsulate and move applications around. And again, the importance of automation and the investments you make on that, making sure you're able to reuse it time and time again, you know, what we see time and time again is how do we help the marketplace deliver this sort of model with OpenStack as the construct for, you know, so to speak, the cloud platform without having all the customization and unique development that happens within a Facebook or a Google, for example. I think, you know, the other thing, um, a lot of attention has been placed on sort of compute as a service and storage as a service. Amazon obviously had an infrastructure as a service offer with EC2. A lot of their enterprise customers <coughs> wanted essentially the virtual private cloud model where essentially they could bring their own private IP address space and attach their specific network and security policies to a, share, uh, to a uh, uh, pooled compute and storage environment. So one of the fastest uh, you know, growing services for them moves them into this private paradigm with VPC. If you look at the user experience from a Contrail perspective, we're really starting with that private uh, paradigm um, and, and the workflow is, is very similar. And a lot of the primitives that you see in the AWS VPC APIs have been mapped directly into Open Contrail. The Contrail team had um, submitted uh, into OpenStack the AWS VPC uh, blueprint um, in, in order to es essentially establish those mappings. And many of our customers on one key use case that John showed before are startups who start in AWS and as they grow, they may build OpenStack private clouds on premise. They want to be able to use the exact same scripts between the AWS VPC environment and their on-premise OpenStack cloud environment. Um, and that workload portability where they don't have to rewrite and reconfigure um, you know, their, uh, their policies is very important to them. So we're working with several social networking and gaming co uh, companies where that is the paradigm. That, that's quite different from, let's say, someone who starts in an enterprise financial environment and they have this phenomenon of shadow IT where some of their application teams who really need a cloud environment go into the public cloud and then they have to repatriate those loads back into the private environment. From a network perspective, obviously, this is about interconnectivity, but getting that sort of consistency between the application layer um, as well as uh, you know, abstracting the infrastructure is what makes all of this hybrid cloud uh, difficult. And you have to accept in, in this world, clearly the network becomes more and more important as part of the overall solution set for a hybrid cloud. And given that we're in OpenStack, you can't have that conversation with addressing the reality of Neutron. You know, I think there's fundamentally two camps going on in the dialogue. One is how do you make Neutron better or how do you use Neutron or do you use Neutron as a set of APIs? What we liked in terms of what we've done together is we're clearly in, in the camp that says, Let's treat Neutron as a set of APIs. There's a number of issues as most of you are familiar with and kind of articulated about on the slide in terms of scalability and challenges. But if you treat the SDN, in this case, Open Contrail as the SDN that plugs into Neutron, the SDN addresses these issues and makes the network quite extensible. The, the other view we have is that fundamentally we are constantly, as canonical, looking at a cross-section of SDNs, working with many, many of them, actually almost all of them. And we run them through our OpenStack interoperability level lab to make sure we have a degree of confidence that they work with our distribution of OpenStack. When we started this journey with Contrail, we saw them as furthest along um, in addressing the shortcomings of Neutron and creating a network, as we were just articulating, that's able to supply um, in essence, the foundation for a hybrid cloud model. That doesn't mean that everything's perfect, but I think the yardstick for success right now is, are you doing it better than anybody else and are we satisfying the vast majority of the needs to deliver a hybrid cloud model? And that's why we've woven this solution together to make some decisions to be able to solve that very problem. I think what we found with some of our uh, initial Contrail deployments is 
uh, th there were compromises in the network. Um, you know, th this idea of keeping sort of failure domains very small and being able to scale horizontally uh, were some of the issues. Uh, the ability to tie in sort of virtualized services uh, that may be, you know, multi-vendor services that are presented uh, in service templates was the other major thing that I think differentiated, uh, you know, Contrail from some, some of the capabilities in default uh, upstream uh, Neutron. So we, we, because we've been working with a, a lot of the, you know, tier one carriers, a lot of the large enterprises, this notion of sort of network as a service without compromise um, is, uh, is a pretty high bar and, uh, you know, I think that's the, the bar that we hold ourselves to. So at the end of the day, this is a architectural diagram of how we're trying to make this work. You know, clearly we're combining a couple elements that reside in both our companies. One is uh, the Open Contrail SDN, uh, mapped through Neutron to Ubuntu OpenStack as fundamentally the OpenStack that's combined and in the solution. We're using a tool set that we've created within Canonical and tools that have been developed within Juniper that fundamentally do a couple things that are really important. We're automating the install, so the install of OpenStack as part of this overall solution with the ND SDN is a very easy exercise. What we have found time and time again is just the deployment of OpenStack for those of you that have gone through the process is difficult, right? So by automating that, we allow getting to the functionality uh, for that to happen much quicker. The, the other part is we're automating the scalability of this, right? We're trying to make the fact that you want to deploy a workload on an OpenStack private cloud or move it to a public cloud is really not a painful process. And again, it's not perfect at the moment, but again, we think we're further along than any other element. Um, certainly analytics, diagnostics, and we're using our tool set Juju, which is a service model. So you ultimately encapsulate every application. You're able to weave them together, so a web service with a database, and you're able to automate that deployment and the scaling. So it's not just a deployment exercise, but a management, a scale up and scale down exercise. Yeah, I think this partnership has been really important to us because obviously in OpenStack where you're converging the compute storage and network functions, uh, we, we've introduced a, a kernel module uh, with the vRouter, which is where you know, we can do distributed routing. And initially there was a lot of concern about, well, if you introduce a kernel module, um, you know, how do we support that? You know, as you know, uh, sort of many of the kernel modules uh, that are not upstream create uh, a, a question of, well, you know, how, how, does a, how does a commercial support model work? Part of the partnership that we've, dra uh, that we've crafted here, um, we've been working very closely with the canonical engineering team to make sure that as these things are tested as a full stack, the converged uh, uh, solution comes together in a way that is commercially supportable. That's what we refer to as Contrail Cloud. And as, as customers adopt a lot of the tools, you know, there, there are many ways to, uh, to provision uh, a, a stack. The canonical Canonical team obviously has been investing a lot with their tools in addressing those, you know, initial provisioning as well as ongoing operational challenges. At the same time, you know, we've we've uh, seen a lot of our customers contributing about back their best practices using things like Puppet and Chef and Ansible, which are purely configuration management and don't address a lot of the, you know, ongoing automation and operational challenges that uh, are at the system level. Um, so that's an ongoing journey. I think uh, um, we make a reference here to Contrail Cloud because that's uh, the, the sort of introduction that we did of a Ubuntu open stack plus Contrail networking stack. And then obviously as we've worked with the Canonical team around charming up the Contrail install, all of that comes together and that's something that uh, you'll see out on the floor as well. Yeah, one of the things we've tried to do with Juju is make that app encapsulation easy. So, you know, when we talk about Chef or we talk about Puppet or we talk about different languages like Go or Bash, you're able to write the charm in whatever language you're familiar with. So. Even the scripting that you've done with Shep and Puppet is preservable in the charm and reusable. And what we really want to highlight is that reusable piece, right? Because those investments are investments that any company have already made and they don't want to lose and have to redo. So we've tried to make the model very extensible, building on what's already been done by any individual company. Lastly, we recognize that finding and managing the nodes and deploying them is really important, and that's where we use MAS, our metal as a service, which really just identifies the nodes, deploys the operating system, Ubuntu or any other operating system, and it allows for the scale up, scale down model. Um, 
Yeah, so I think, um, you know, hybrid cloud, as I mentioned before, has been difficult. There's a lot of questions around how do we achieve application consistency um, across uh, heterogeneous environments. I think a lot of the focus on containerization and this promise of write once, run anywhere is obviously indicative of the challenges that folks have had where they've had to port different application components to different versions of the Linux kernel, different storage drivers, et cetera. That at the application layer is getting a lot of attention because it has been a vi very big pain point. At the network network layer, a lot of what we've been doing uh, with a, uh, an IP control plane is federating uh, heterogeneous environments. If you think of the early days of, of uh, IP networking, the problem that folks had was that they had a number of different proprietary LAN protocols, SNA, AppleTalk, DetNet, et cetera, and they needed one abstraction, one mediation layer for the network where these things could interconnect. In a hybrid cloud scenario, you now have AWS VPC and an OpenStack on-premise cloud and VMware um, and other public cloud offerings, and our job as a network provider is to not discriminate and interconnect those in a secure and, and resilient way. So that network layer in between the application and the hardware infrastructure is obviously uh, the core competence. Um, and in, in doing so, we've extended what's worked in the past around um, IP VPNs and MPLS VPNs, where we're able to, to take a shared IP fabric and carve out private tenant networks and attach policies to those private networks. And <clears throat> obviously, this discussion wouldn't be complete without recognizing that Deployment can be in both virtual machines with hypervisors and, uh, you know, KVM, EXX, et cetera, or with containers, you know, Docker, LXC. Um, for those of you that are aware, as Canonical, we also announced this week something we're doing called LexD, which is a light visor for managing containers. So we're taking this and extending it not only into virtual machines, but into containers as well. Six months ago in Paris, we announced this partnership, and one of the inquiries we both got as companies was, is this just another logo swap? Because um, there's plenty of slideware and plenty of announcement that occur at every OpenStack summit. Um, we were quite explicit that that's exactly what it's not. We've been doing a number of exercises, including deep engineering engagement, improvement of our models together, um, and between now and then, so in a six month period, we announced the partnership, we've done some engineering, and also we've actually been out and, and working with a number of customers. Um, because we think it's important when you make these sort of announcements that they are more than just an announcement of people with an intent to work together. So uh, today, we're also gonna have Pier One talk a bit, which is one of our early joint customers. Why don't you introduce? Yeah, so we'd like to bring up Gary. He's a senior architect with uh, Pier One and Kojiko Data Services uh, to talk a little about the journey they've been on, both from a uh, network security evolution perspective and this extension into OpenStack. So hey, thanks Gary. for being here, Gary. Thanks okay. very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate uh, you guys asking us to uh, come up and talk about what we've seen happen with um, OpenStack. Are we going to to the next one? Oh, you have to just do the, the down arrow. The down oh. arrow. All right, well, as a bit of context, I'd like to sort of run through the 30-second who at Pier 1, as uh, that maybe informs a lot of uh, our experience and why Contrail and Ubuntu has been helpful to us in making progress. Um, Pier 1 is a global hosting business. Um, we have a very broad spectrum of products. I think it's fair to say if if your needs boil down to servers in a data center, we can probably help you in some way. Um, we cover really all the bases between managed cloud and just space and power. Um, we've been around since 1999, um, so that is an age in the hosting business, I think it's fair to say. And uh, one of the consequences of that is we think we've seen a lot of trends over time. Um, we've seen a few things which didn't work. Um, We've got a lot of experience in deployment of new paradigms. Um, so moving to a more integrated, a more converged cloud environment has been something which has taken us some time as we've looked at all the options. Um, we've been keen to do it properly and not just make it a very siloed product is something I think we've seen with a lot of early cloud products. They've just sat very much on their own and they've not integrated with providers other products. It's you can have that, but it's a separate thing and a separate portal to everything else they're offering. Um, we are part of the Kojiko group of companies. Um, 
our sister company is Kojiko Data Services, who we are currently integrating our products with a bit more. Um, more than the standard marketing slide, this is an interesting one because Kojiko Data Services operate uh, metro networks in the Toronto and Montreal areas. And uh, we're quite excited about the opportunity to build sort of end-to-end -end solutions um, where we can offer metro access into hosted services. Uh, and that's one of the ways in which Contrail is helping us is it's giving us a network paradigm which fits in with the rest of our network. Um, I should also touch on who am I. Um, as the guy said, I'm Gary McKenzie. I'm senior architect for Pier 1 and Kojiko Data Services. One of my responsibilities, primary responsibility right now, is for running um, cloud proof of concept activity. So my job is to design what our next generation cloud infrastructure is going to look like underneath. I'll move on to talk a little bit about our network. Um, probably unusually for a hosting provider, we have a global network. It's a full IPMPLS backbone. We have network presence in six countries. Um, we are at every major internet exchange um, there is, really. Um, we are committed to a multi-vendor environment in our network, which I think is an important thing to say. Um, it's uh, very easy to assume when we're talking about open contrail, but um, we come to it as a Juniper customer. We are a Juniper customer. We're a big Juniper customer, but we are not universally a Juniper customer. We are very committed to the idea that we should have two options in each of our core network spaces. We don't want to be tied into a hardware vendor. We have a concern about that. So one of the things we look for when we're evaluating products in all areas is that there's an interoperability option. Um, example being we use uh, Juniper's MPLS view to do our uh, MPLS traffic planning and such. And that's something that works across the board with Juniper equipment, Cisco, Brocade. Uh, and that's something that's critical to us. And in that respect, Contrail is a good option, um, as it's nice to see it has a proven track record with, at the core level, Juniper MX and Cisco ASR 9K. Um, so that's, uh, that's something which is very important to us. Just catch up with my notes. <laughs> Um, also on the slide, just to fill it out really, I put on our internet map, which we did a few years ago. This is, uh, there is an updated version now, with, um, which is uh, iPhone and Android app. Um, I like to include it on these sort of things. I think it speaks well to our interest and commitment to the network. Um, anyone who's ever been accosted by Peer One sales team will probably know that we're very proud of our network, and we like to sell on the quality a lot. Um, one thing which comes out of that is obviously operating an international backbone is not a cheap exercise. And we recover some of that by the fact that we can sell on network quality. And our customers acknowledge that our network quality is very high. Um, but we're also very keen that we leverage what we have. Um, and we provide end-to-end -end services over the network that we can integrate everything from quite deep in our cloud environments and map that onto services right down to customer premises via MPLS in a seamless manner. Um, it's one of those things which is often possible, but you end up with your engineers tying things together with string on an individual case-by-case -case basis, and that's not something which is scalable or supportable one day. That breaks in some way, and no one quite knows how it was put together. So the ability to build seamless end-to-end -end services through the network is important to us. Um, the challenges we see from cloud platforms are quite varied. I've, I've split them out, and I was thinking when I was looking at this slide earlier that actually they're all technical challenges in some way. <laughs> um, but. Uh, some are driven by different things, I guess, is the easiest way to put it. Our customer requirements are, I guess, the central thing we have to worry about. Um, we are a managed hosting company in many respects. Our value proposition is that we're offering a high level of service, a high level of flexibility and customizability. Um, because of that, we have we have to have a great deal of flexibility in how we provide solutions. It's not 
acceptable to have. We can do this in this way, and that's it. You can take it or leave it. That's, I would say, the AWS way, perhaps. Um, it's not something which works for our customers. Customers want to, they have an idea of how they want things delivered, and um, they want to see us help them out with that. So that's one of the requirements. We have a great deal of flexibility in how we deliver solutions. We want the underlying infrastructure to enable us to do as many different things as possible. That we can solve the problem one way is not necessarily enough if that's not the way the customer wants to solve it. Um, it's obviously it's a service provider specific challenge, um, but uh, it's one which occupies a lot of our time. Um, I've spoken a bit about the ability to integrate services into a single platform. Obviously, we get a lot of customers asking, why can't I manage my physical machines in the same portal as I can manage my virtuals? Why is the cloud platform over there? Why do I have a separate portal for storage? A um, big demand is that everything has a consistent management interface and a consistent level of management, um, which feeds into the amount of self-service which users are demanding. That's, it's obviously a feedback from the larger sort of hyperscale cloud providers, AWS, GCC, Azure, whoever you want to name, um, that everything is self-service. The thing we come across is customers want that level of self-service at times, but they also want the level of support which goes with a managed product. Um, so that's something we're having to integrate. And with a wider product suite, with multiple ways to do things, self-service is a greater challenge than when you have one methodology. Um, the technical challenges we have are the simple ones. Um, the stack scale we deal with as a hosting provider makes even relatively simple things pretty complex. Um, we, the network paradigms are the easy one, and they're, I guess, what we're talking about most here. Um, 4,096 VLANs doesn't cut it in these stacks for us. We need a different option for that. And moving to VXLAN, moving to MPLS-based services is something that needs to happen. Um, that's one of the technical challenges is we need to find a way to scale out the networks where we may have it easily conceivable we'd have 10,000 layer two segments in a larger um, environment. Depending, obviously it feeds back into the customer flexibility. There's lots of customers who they might only have you know, 20, 30 instances, but they might also somehow manage to have 20 to 30 layer two segments linking them in various ways. Um, and that's their decision to make, and we need to provide the infrastructure which enables that. Um, the other network paradigm which is a problem is security. Um, John and Jennifer have already spoken to this, that um, Security was very easy when your server plugged into a port and it was in a VLAN behind a firewall. But when it's a cloud instance and you don't really know where it's going to be, the need to apply a ubiquitous security policy to a service hasn't diminished, but it's got an awful lot harder to ensure you're doing it. Um, from our point of view, particularly in some of the verticals we serve, some of our customers, it's not just about um, that we can do it, but it's about we can prove we can do it. It's about the auditability of that. Um, the last one is something that uh, feeds into, again, what we're talking about with Contrail. The era of having one hosting provider is over, is something we've heard a lot of from our customers. We did some research last year um, when we were looking at new cloud products. And one of the things we got out of it is for the organizations which are planning to deploy cloud, two thirds of them are intend to work with two or more providers or already are. Um, this is, I think it's important to say when we say two or more, we're not talking about their internal IT, we're talking about two external providers. It's internal and peer one and AWS. Um, and that means we need to build interoperability. We need to be able to connect to other environments. It's, it's not optional, walled gardens are not, not something that's an option anymore. Um, we have a large customer who depends on us to do the heavy lifting for their application. Uh, we do some GPU-based compute for them. It's something of a speciality of Peer ones, and they like that solution, but they also want their web front end to reside on AWS for scalability, for 
cost, if nothing else. Um, and that's a, it's a perfectly logical design, design decision for their environment. But that's a customer we've had for a couple of years. When we built that solution, it's not pretty building something where you've got secure and consistent communication between AWS into our environment. Um, it was done in the era prior to uh, AWS's VPC product. Um, VPC has changed things a bit. Um, VPC, its great problem is that it follows the AWS methodology of there's one way of doing things, that's the paradigm it exists in. If that doesn't work for you, then there isn't an option. Um, but it, it very much points to the fact that we need to find ways to interoperate. And for different cloud providers, different options, whether you know it's on-premises IT for enterprises as well, there isn't a single way. We need to enable a lot of different ways to interoperate, whether that's Layer 3 VPN services, eVPN, IPsec VPN from you know, a virtual SRX using NFV on your OpenStack platform. The ability to spin up that service and just say, I want to connect this, this service to something else. Um, and do that seamlessly is really important to customers, and it's only going to become more so. Um, I fully expect that that two-thirds of organizations will become four-fifths in a year to two years. It's Oops. Um, how are Peer One transitioning to OpenStack? Um, well, one of the reasons that it's taken us a long time to look at OpenStack is OpenStack has been hard to deploy traditionally. It's always been possible, but it's not been about, for us, it's not been about that it's possible, it's about that it's scalable, simple, and reproducible. Um, now, Contrail has solved a lot of network problems, and working with Canonical as well has solved a lot of the deployment and automation problems. And it's allowed us to bring more data out of the OpenStack environment from Contrail, the northbound APIs for analytics are something that looks really promising, um, something I'm very keen to get into soon. Um, but that information coming out of it in a sort of systematic and consistent way is really useful. Also, when it comes to deployment, um, things like Juju Charms are a major step forward for us, we feel. It's, um, it's something which makes deployment a lot more consistent and simple to do. And right. I'll hand back to these guys. <laughs> Not for me talking. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Thanks very much for, uh, for sharing the thoughts there. Um, we're just going to bring it home with just a little bit of an example. In, in the slide that John showed earlier, where many of the emerging customers do have this expectation where not only may they write some of their early development in the public cloud and then repatriate that load into their private cloud environment, very often, and we're working with one very large gaming and entertainment company, where they have different tiers of their three-tier application, where the front-end web server tier, because it's very spiky, will run in the public cloud. That gives them access to you know, capacity on demand. They keep their private data, customer data, gaming statistics in their private cloud environment. Now that the, uh, the issue there, they get the benefit of the public cloud and the auto sc elastic scaling for spiky loads. And this is a gaming provider that has millions of concurrent users using uh, their platform at the same time. Um, and they don't have to move their data until they're ready to replicate it into uh, another environment. Um, so the example here, and I'm, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail. We do have a, a hybrid cloud scenario posted on YouTube and on the Open Contrail channel. Uh, we've done this environment with AWS VPC as well as other public clouds like SoftLayer. Um, some of those videos are posted. Um, you know, the ability to create a private cloud environment in OpenStack, name your virtual networks, and create a service template, in our case with a VSRX or another virtualized firewall capability, that that abstracts essentially or separates the policy from the actual configuration of the device or, or of the service itself, but exposes essentially in this case firewall as a service to the, to the private. And then we show essentially a workflow where through the AWS VPC, we essentially create a virtual private cloud in Amazon, um, insert essentially uh, the IP uh, address and subnet of the uh, private cloud environment on the corporate network and show that essentially we've established a VPN tunnel between those two clouds. 
Um, that solves not only the network problem, and because we have a layer three control plane and we can carve out private subnets and have that connect with your corporate network as an extension of the private environment, um, obviously solves the network security problem, but it also solves this issue that ha people have about how do I pass my compliance and keep essentially you know, the same policies and the same scripts that I've you know, tested over time, um, and then essentially use the benefits of the public cloud. I don't have to essentially go and renumber my IP addresses, all of the DNS, DHCP issues that often come up as you move a workload are solved uh, on, on the fly. So please uh, take a look at that. We're showing some of those uh, demos in our, in our booth as well as uh, online. Um, just to kind of bring it home, this is not something that's you know, future out there. We, we've been working with a lot of emerging customers that really need that flexibility and have already in their development processes uh, done that within an application, different components sitting in different uh, clouds. Yeah, so <clears throat> to keep in mind, maybe just to, to, to wrap this up, you know, since Paris, in six months, I think we've accomplished a lot. And as Gary pointed out, we're actually doing it in the marketplace. So think of this as a couple key takeaways. This is all about not only automation, but simplification and reuse. It's also absolutely about using Neutron as an API and then plugging an SDN like Open Contrail, which can be completely successful in doing what you need to do with the network, making it extensible, make it work in a hybrid cloud. The, the nuance here is that none of this works if you're unable to make the deployment of OpenStack and the SDN simple, easy, and automated. That's what allows for application portability and all the use cases we've talked about uh, for a hybrid cloud model. Since I know we're pushing right up against the, uh, the time we had allocated, we'll, we'll wrap it up and the three of us will be available outside if you have any questions, because I don't know if we have any time for questions right now, and I'm told no, but I'll take one question. <laughs> Anybody, you can, one question? Okay, no, we'll just go out and feel free to talk to us. All right, thank you.